morning. Thanks for joining us. I pray that your hearts are open to our worship service this morning. We are virtual only this morning because of what I hope is a bunch of snow outside. I'm recording this on Friday and hope that it was worth the effort to bring you this service. Uh, but I know that God's here no matter what. And thank you for taking the time out of your day and off your sleds to be with us this morning. We have a worship service planned and I'm so thankful that we have a, uh, resources to make this happen. If everything goes well, then you can thank Sarah for doing an excellent job. Uh, but if something goes wrong, you can blame me. Um, but I know that this service will be a blessing to many of you, and I pray for you, pray for you this week. And um, as our kids are out of school, likely because of the weather, uh, pray for our healthcare workers, of course, as, as they continue to deal with the pandemic, regardless of what the weather is like. Um, just wanted to remind you next week, uh, we will have our Hope and Consolation service that was originally scheduled for today. I really wanted this to be an in-person experience. We will stream the service as well, but we will have it in person next week uh, at our 1030 service. So again, the Hope and Consolation service will be next week. But for now, why don't we go to God in prayer? Lord God, we give you thanks for this day. Although we woke up this morning not knowing what would happen. You assure us of your presence, that no matter the weather, no matter the events of this world, no matter our emotions or even our attitude, you are in control. And you remind us each and every day in numerous ways of your sovereignty, how you are present in our lives in all circumstances, and for that we give you thanks. Help us to be thankful in all circumstances of life. For even when we go through the valleys, we see glimpses of the mountains around us. We see our potential. We see your light in this epiphany season that guides us to the peaks so that we might be close to you. We pray, Lord God, that you will bless our congregation, bless those who are not able to worship this morning, bless those who chose not to worship this morning, perhaps enjoying the outside. Lord God, I pray your blessing upon us all that we might worship you with our whole heart, that we might praise your name in word and song. Thank you, Lord God, for our brothers and sisters who are serving in a sacrificial way this morning, especially those who are working, our healthcare workers, our military personnel, first responders, all those who had to go to work on this difficult morning for travel. We pray, Lord God, that you will bless their hearts, give peace to their souls. For those who are enduring loss and are looking for comfort, we pray that your word might be opened but also that their hearts be open to your leading. We pray, Lord God, that you will continue to equip us in this year ahead, that we be your servants and your disciples and spread that good news as much as we can so that others can have hope, hope that a new day will come the bright dawn of our salvation is upon us. Thanks be to Jesus. Amen.
Hey! Welcome to another episode of What Happens in a Pastor's House on Sunday Mornings! Today, we're making wishes, and they're coming true. Watch this. Hey, Luke, what do you wish for? I wish some little rain candy. Rain candy? That can't happen. There's no way. Whoa, whoa it's raining candy! Oh, that's so awesome! Oh my goodness! Is that all it's gonna rain? Who needs snow when you got. Candy raining from the sky. Okay, no, we're not gonna eat candy. Let's put the candy back. Let's put the candy back. Put it back. Okay, uh, come down here. Thank you. Thank you. Oh man, that was that was really cool. Uh, maybe we should try again. Hey, Philip, what would you wish for? I wish for um, Luke would turn into a Lego. Luke turn into a Lego. <gasps> it worked. Whoa, Luke's a Lego. Look at Luke. He's a Lego. Oh no, he's a Lego. Well, that's okay. He'll just have to hang out with us on, all, on top of the candy. Oh wow. What you gonna do with Luke as, now that he's a Lego? Let's turn him back. Let's turn it back. <laughs> oh no, I think he's cool like, as a Lego. All right, let's see. What? Who's next? James is gonna make a wish. All right, James, what's your wish gonna be? I wish my dad could have hair. Radical man, how did you get that to work? Whoa, all these wishes, that's so cool. We should just keep on wishing because everything keeps happening like we wish. Oh, I love my hair, it's so awesome. Actually, and Luke is a Lego now. I have hair. Actually, Everybody got the wishes. We got candy. Well, actually, oh, it's so great. Oh, guys, I got to tell you about this crazy dream I just had. I dreamed that we all made wishes and it came true. Like, Luke dreamed that it would rain candy, and it did. Like, candy fell from the sky. Philip dreamed that Luke turned into a Lego, and he did. Yeah, right there on the counter, he's still on the counter. And James dreamed that I had hair, and then hair just appeared on my head. Not just hair, but long hair flowing locks. It was great mm -hmm. to have all that hair. Oh man, that was a crazy dream. But it, you know, we know that it's just a dream, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we don't get everything that we wish for in life. James, wait, why do you think that we don't get everything we wish for in life? Because um, God doesn't send everything. Mm -hmm. If he if he does, the world will just be crazy. Yeah, the world would be crazy. If God, if God granted all of our wishes, like that, that would be crazy, especially if Luke was like a little Lego. And if it rained candy, we would eat tons and tons of candy. What happens when we eat tons and tons of candy? We get a bellyache. Yeah, we get a bellyache. That's right. So God knows what's best. God is the only one who knows what's best. And God takes care of us because God knows what's best. So he's not going to give us everything we ask for because God has a great plan in store for us. And sometimes candy raining from the sky is not part of that good plan. Luke in the form of a Lego, not part of that good plan. Daddy with a lot of hair, not part of that good plan, right? So just want to let you guys know that. So let's, uh, how about we start off today with a prayer. Dear God, thank you for such a good sleep that we had and a crazy dream. Thank you for fun times and, and times where we can smile and laugh. And we pray your blessings on us and to take care of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's go get breakfast. Yay! Yeah.
Thank you again for joining us this morning. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit this morning about how some of you might be feeling in the month of January. This is a feeling that I feel every January after Christmas. Um, the excitement of Christmas took so many weeks uh, to build and and then it's all over. Um, the tree might still be up but it, it's it's empty or the lights aren't even on if you remember this morning when I opened up the service I stood or sat by the tree and uh, we haven't even turned the lights on the tree in a while and yet it's still up we we haven't taken it down um, and and it's kind of depressing um, to be honest um, there's just nothing left of, of Christmas much outside of the clearance shelves and the department stores um, we might have a few storage boxes laying around or perhaps you still have your tree up um, I think we might take it down this weekend while we're snowed in and give the boys something to do and something to break. But it's, it's a feeling um, that many of us have in January. Psychologists um, have actually named it. It's, they've called it the post-Christmas blues. Um, and, it, and it is a result from all of the effort that we put into one day. The, the hoopla of Christmas with all of the church services and family visiting and food preparing and the parties and grandma and the list goes on and and, and when all of that is done um, a sort of depression natural depression sinks in into our hearts and we have to go back to the real world we have to go back to everyday life and, and work and, and school um, and if you're retired you have to go back to all your doctor's appointments as they open um, back up but as I thought about this post Christmas blues it reminded me of the Christmas story and we usually spend weeks preparing for the Christmas story by reading the events leading up to that wonderful starry night but if you read the entire Christmas story you know that after the holy night um, I'm not gonna say silent night um, because we all know what happens when you, you you have a baby and if you have a baby in a manger with a bunch of animals um, it's not a silent night but it's a holy night because our Lord and Savior was was born after that night it was chaotic not only was it chaotic leading up to that night but it was chaotic afterwards as Mary and Joseph had to flee for the baby's life and and that's what I think about in the month of January that that we're not alone that the Holy Family experience probably worse than what we would experience so you're thinking about how their life was turned upside down and you know nothing would ever be the same again I wanted to to read this passage this morning and to reflect on it um, if you would offer um, some time to God this morning so so let's read this passage in Matthew chapter 2 When the wise men had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity 
who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So you can see how chaotic it was after the birth of our Lord and, and Savior. There, there wasn't any time to just enjoy the moment. Um, after the visit of the wise men, Mary and Joseph um, go to bed and, and let's suppose that they got some sleep and they were sleeping soundly when all of a sudden Joseph has a dream, another dream, and is told to flee to Egypt because Herod is going to try to kill Jesus. I mean, they could not even enjoy the moment. Um, they were they were running for his his life, um, and, and I just can't imagine what that felt like. And in comparing it to the feelings that I have after Christmas, um, you know, I'm not being forced from my home. No one's trying to to uh, come after me. Um, it really makes me think about how God, even in the midst of the chaos, took care of the Holy Family. And how, how God still takes care of us in, in our, our moments of January. When we um, are perhaps just depressed um, or, or just saddened. Um, because the the season has ended and and life has gotten back to normal, but there's several things I just want to talk about um, in this in this story that I hope that you recognize, and if not, then you perhaps will now. But the first thing that I notice when I read the story is Joseph's obedience. Did you notice how obedient Joseph was? And he didn't waste any time when when God said to go. He go. He 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 got the holy family ready that night and headed out to to Egypt. They didn't wait until morning. And and I, I just think about what that means for for Joseph. You know, he and Mary had traveled from Nazareth to Bethlehem, expecting to just stay for a few days and then return. But they hadn't planned on moving because their family was back in Nazareth. They they hadn't even said goodbye. They didn't bring a wagon loaded with their furniture and their valuables and their furnishings. I mean, Joseph probably had a carpenter shop back in Nazareth. What would happen to that? But in the middle of the night, God said, move. And Joseph didn't argue with God. He didn't say, hey, God, you got a plan B. He didn't wait to try to figure it all out. He just obeyed. And I think that's why God chose Joseph to be the stepfather of Jesus. God knew his heart. He knew, as it said in verse 19, that he was a righteous man, and, and Joseph was sensitive to God's will. The other thing, or, or something else I, I, I noticed, is, in, is God's provision and how God provides. When, when God calls us to do something, God provides for us so that we can do it. How could God send the holy couple away empty-handed? Well, he didn't. God wouldn't have told Mary and Joseph to go to Egypt and then say, okay, you're on your own. Good luck. They would need enough money to live off of while down in Egypt, and God provided for them through the wise man. 
in all of our moments of life, even the moments when we are downtrodden, God lifts us up. God provides. Another thing to look at is, is um, Herod's anger. You know, talk about the post-Christmas blues. You know, we don't include this part in our Christmas <laughs> plays. Um, we don't include Mary and Joseph running off the stage, running for their lives, fleeing the country. Um, it, it's not part of the holiday picture to think about the, the, the killing of the infants um, in, in Israel. But when we take a look, when we take a closer look at, at Herod, we, we see how mean and vicious he was. You know, history has a lot to say about him. Um, Caesar Augustus was quoted as saying that it would be better to be King Herod's pig than his son. Pigs were protected by law. Herod's family wasn't. King Herod had already killed two of his own sons, and he, he had them strangled. He also killed one of his ten wives, his favorite wife, because he thought that she had been unfaithful to him. Because he thought she had been unfaithful to him, when in reality she wasn't. He killed his 18-year-old brother-in-law because the Jews liked him better than they liked Herod. He also killed his own uncle and his mother-in-law. What's a few babies in Bethlehem to King Herod? King Herod was a terrible person. The, we see that the slaughter of the innocent children in Bethlehem was a fulfillment of prophecy, according to Jeremiah. Now, what does this have to do with Rachel and Ramah? Well, Rachel was the wife of Jacob, and she was buried in Bethlehem. Where is Ramah? Bethlehem was about five miles south of Jerusalem, and Ramah was about five miles north of Jerusalem. It's like Herod took a pencil and drew a circle around Jerusalem, probably 10 miles north and south of Jerusalem, and said, kill every boy under two years of age in this circle. But the point is that even though Herod was such a terrible person, even though Herod was the the ultimate antagonist in this story he didn't win god would eventually win thanks to an intervention in a dream god would win thanks to the obedience of joseph god would win and that's what happens in life god's plan ultimately prevails it had been God's plan all along for Jesus to come out of Egypt. Just like his children did 1,500 years before under the leadership of Moses. Mary and Joseph wouldn't be alone in Egypt. By this time, Egypt was also under Roman rule, but Herod didn't have any power there. There, there were already thousands of Jews who had fled there to find safety from the wicked King Herod. There were Jewish settlements there with synagogues and a temple. The land that had once enslaved the Jews, God now used to protect them. In verse 19, it says King Herod finally dies, and then Joseph has another dream, and the angels speak to him once again. It says, go back to the land of Israel. Mary and Joseph were probably on their way back to Nazareth by way of Jerusalem, and then uh, again, no, no questions, no ask. It's time to go back home. God had protected them, and now they could return to Israel. God didn't want Jesus to be brought up in Egypt. God had delivered them from Egypt 1,500 years before, and he didn't want his son raised in that heathen environment. But Joseph has another dream. <laughs> As they're on their way home, I mean, see how the chaos, there's no time to settle down. There's no time to really uh, experience Christmas. Joseph heard that Herod's son was on the throne, Archelaus, and he was worse than his father. So they headed north as fast as they could to Nazareth in Galilee. 
And again, this also fulfilled the prophecy from the Old Testament. Nazareth was a small town. We know it was famous for not being famous. <laughs> no one had ever heard of Nazareth. It isn't even mentioned in the Old Testament. Not far from Nazareth, the major highways running north and south and east and west crossed there. It was so insignificant, that famous passage from John, when Nathaniel said, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? But we know there's something special about insignificant towns. O little town of Bethlehem, we know what can happen in insignificant little towns. But Nazareth, unknown Nazareth, is where God wanted to have his son raised, a place outside of politics, outside of prosperity, outside of notoriety. He wanted his son to be raised in a simple village without fame or prestige. So what can we learn from this? Well, one, the safest place to be is where God leads you. God has a plan for you. And where God wants you, that's where you're going to be safe. The wise men followed a star and it led them to Christ. The wise men followed God's instructions in a dream and they escaped Herod's wrath. Joseph followed the angel's instructions in a dream and escaped to Egypt. Joseph then followed God's instruction in a dream again to escape the wrath of Archelaus. The safest place you can be is in the center of God's will. Whatever path you take in life, God knows where it will lead. How much better to follow the path that he leads you down? What else can we learn? Well, a Christian isn't exempt from troubles. We can't skip the month of January. We can't skip these feelings that we perhaps feel after Christmas. We know that there will be chaos. There will be uh, moments of letdown, there will be depression. We know in our Christian life there will be troubles. But we're still called in every circumstance to give thanks and praise to God. Now, some people think, why didn't God just get rid of King Herod? You know, he had the power to just get rid of this character in the story, and it could be a happy children's book that that we can read from beginning to end well God eventually takes care of Herod he eventually died like the dog he was um, Archelaus also died um, in exile a terrible death the point is God will win out in the end but in the meantime he gives us strength to go on and to win every battle that we face. If we just follow that path that he sets before us. God is in charge. God is in charge. You can always feel safe when you are living in God's will. Now that's not to say bad things won't happen to you. But God is in charge. Everything that happened in the Christmas story was planned out by God. And you can see it. You can see his hand in the story every step of the way. Joseph and Mary experienced the ultimate post-Christmas blues. They didn't have their baby in Bethlehem and then live happily ever after. Their dreams of going back to Nazareth to live a quiet and peaceable life were postponed for a few years. Their life was nothing like they had planned or expected after the baby was born. So maybe um, this third Sunday in January, you're still dealing with some post-Christmas blues for, of yourself. Maybe Christmas wasn't what you expected. Maybe you didn't get that favorite toy or maybe you perhaps didn't get to spend time with a loved one like you normally do because of travel plans or because of the, the coronavirus. Maybe you burnt Christmas dinner or the neighbor's dogs got it or you found yourself eating duck at the local Chinese restaurant. Or simply now that Christmas is over, all the excitement 
has passed and it just feels like your balloon has been popped well I know it doesn't help too much but I have to say it reading the entire Christmas story as presented in Matthew it could always be worse when you feel those blues creeping in in the month of January threatening to damper this this new year spirit this hope that we have for a good year I invite you to just pick up the book the good book and read the entire Christmas story and as you read it, look at how God remained present all throughout it. No matter what happened, God was in charge. God knew what was best for the Holy Family. And because of the obedience of Joseph and Mary, they experienced the ultimate blessing. They went where God wanted them to go, and, and Jesus grew up. And, and did wonderful things and the ultimate sacrifice in providing salvation for all. God was with them all the way because nothing, nothing can stop our God from ruling our lives, taking care of us and loving us so unconditionally like he does. Nothing can stop him from being in charge. So I pray, brothers and sisters, that you can cheer up. Cheer up, lift your spirits, keep your heads high. Because not only will Christmas 2022 be here before you know it, but I can promise you God is going to take charge. He is going to take care of you the entire year of 2022 and he's going to lead you all the way if you'll let him. And there's nothing blue about that. Let's sing our closing hymn.
Just as the love of God led the Holy Family to Egypt and back to Israel, I pray that the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the comfort of our Holy Spirit guide you this day and all of this year. In Jesus' name, amen.